Welcome everyone to another episode here at the Damage Report. I am John Adarola. Today is a Thursday, which means you don't know who you're gonna get, but you're gonna be very happy with who we chose. Joining us once again after far too long, Viviana Vigil. Welcome back to the Damage Report. Hi, John. Thank you so much for having me. I got the maroon memo, so we are matching mm-hmm. today. Mm-hmm. We have a section on <laughs> our rundown where one or the other of us, whoever gets dressed first, just puts in the color we're going to be wearing because we want to look like a bunch of weirdos as we do the show. <laughs> anyway, the funniest thing is I never wear color. I always wear black shirts, but for some reason this time. Anyway, yeah, you got we'll the see. memo. So thank you exactly. for participating. Exactly. Let's see what, what color we do next time. Uh, but it has been a little while since you've been on the show. What have you been up to? I have been working on an incredible docu-series. I can't talk much more about it, but I'm really proud of it. So hopefully it will get greenlit. It's sort of like lime greenlit right now. So hopefully Mm -hmm. in the next months I will know more. So I know that you can't tell us what it's about. Just just tell us one thing, which A-lister is attached to (laughs) You know him and you love him or her. It's Kevin Bacon. Or them. Anyway, uh, that would be (laughs) exciting. Well, that's awesome, Um, but we have been missing you here. I know the audience is gonna be really exciting uh, to have you back on. And I think that we've got a great rundown full of stories and topics that you should find interesting. We're gonna be starting off with Fox very predictably losing their minds uh, over the SCOTUS opening and the, the likelihood that Joe Biden is going to put a black woman on the court. They cannot take that. Nobody could have seen that coming. And along the way, we're gonna talk about updates on Matt Gates. We've got Dan Bongino being yeeted off of YouTube. We got the right censoring books once again. They don't want your kids to learn anything, so that's gonna be fun. And we have a little bit of good news. This gun regulation, that's interesting. It's not the strongest thing ever, but I like to see experimentation. So over the course of the next 90 minutes, we'll have all of that for you. Um, But along the way, if you wouldn't mind hitting the like button and sharing the stream so that people know we're live, that would be great. And you can send us tweets, comments, super chats, and all that as we go and we'll respond. Want to remind you continually that we are still in the early days of the watch list. You might not yet be used to having something awesome to watch before the damage report. Well, now it's available every day from 9 to 10 Pacific, which would be 12 to 1 Eastern. You can join Jared Jackson and his guests as they do an hour of awesome news and politics and culture and maybe sometimes a little bit of movies and sports and all that. It's been a lot of fun, the reaction has been great. And you can watch that on twitch.tv slash TYT or at youtube.com slash watchlist TYT. And it leads very smoothly into the damage report. So you can now be used to that. We form a nice little sandwich. You got the watch list, then you got the damage report and eventually indisputable as well. That's one way to get your day started, and I think it's a pretty good one. In any event, with that, we do have a lot to get to. So, Viviana, you ready to talk about some news? Take it away, sir. You say that, but have you seen the abortion <laughs> GPA story? It's kind of a doozy. Yeah. Okay, well, in any event, with all that said, let's jump into this with our first story. Yesterday, Justice Breyer announced that he would be retiring. And we now know that he plans to do it in either late June or early July, assuming that his replacement has already been confirmed at that point. Now, there's a Democratic president, the Democrats control the Senate. So in theory, this should be a pretty smooth process. But that does not mean that the right is not gonna be as awful as they can be along the way in basically all the ways that you would expect. We predicted this yesterday. Well, let's roll the insanity. Let's roll the just awful nonsense. First up, Tucker Carlson. But Joe Biden, all Joe Biden can talk about is your skin color. Patronizing, that doesn't even begin to describe what this is. This is exactly why decent Americans hated segregation. It dehumanized people. Now, Biden claims that his race counting is essential so that the court and the rest of his administration, quote, looks like America. Of all the lies that Joe Biden tells, this could be the easiest to check. We have the latest census numbers, and we can promise you with dead certainty that Joe Biden's nominees look nothing like America, not even close. Okay, Viviana, I have a lot to say, so I will allow you to jump in first. That's not even all of Tucker Carlson's awful commentary on this, but uh, what do you think? I mean, it's like, where do you begin with this guy? He talks about other people lying and he's just saying the most ridiculous things every single second. You know, we have seen so much going on with the Supreme Court in the last several years. This is an exciting 
venture that we possibly have. I doubt the Biden administration will actually do anything about it. It's just pretty frustrating. But Tucker Carlson, what is he talking about representation? Like they really don't get it. Mm. Does he get it? Is he an idiot? Is he intentional? It's really even hard to speak on this, John, because he says so many in Spanish, we say babosadas, which is just like spit coming out of your mouth. It doesn't it just means nothing, <laughs> it's just drool. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't even know how to respond to his Bible Sabbath, honestly. Uh, I, I will do my best, I will try. <laughs> so uh, I wanna make sure that I don't miss anything. So first of all, invoking being against segregation to argue that black women shouldn't be put on the Supreme Court is just mwah, great job, Tucker Carlson. Pretending that you care, pretending that by the way, if you were broadcasting during segregation, you wouldn't be vociferously in favor of it. That's a fun little uh, note. but. No, there he says several different things. He says um, that uh, the nominees don't look anything like America. That's fairly see-through. I mean, this is the guy who talks about classic Americans, traditional Americans. They do not think that black Americans are truly American and they never will. You, we can read any number of quotes, Toni Morrison and all that stuff. No, it's true. They just. They still do not, or whether he does or not, he knows that his audience doesn't consider a black woman, no matter how qualified, no matter how many decades of public service, she doesn't get to be fully American. And she's not real America. And we don't like quotas, and we don't like identity politics, and there should only ever be white people. We don't believe in identity politics, but I will freak out. If a judge is not black, if a character in a movie is not or is not is not white, I will freak out. If if a person in a movie isn't Why? I will lose my mind while denouncing identity politics. And I will lose my mind for an audience that is overwhelmingly white and likely to stay so. So you forgot Jesus and Santa Claus, John. Forgot Jesus. Exactly. Those two. Yeah. If if you even hint at the possibility, it will no, they they have nothing else. And I don't think that Tucker Carlson cares at all about it. I I fully believe that he's a racist, but I don't think he really cares about this politically, but he knows what his audience has been trained to care about. And he doesn't want anything to replace that. He does not want conservatives to start to think about things that affect the economic quality of their life. And so they instill in that audience a need, a desire for constant identity politics, white identity politics. Yeah, and it's a constant gaslighting with Tucker and you know, segregation of the Supreme Court, bad segregation and voting, good. So I, you know, they really want to redefine the voting areas. They want to restrict voting for people. That's okay. But once we get people on the Supreme Court, then it's an issue. And yeah. it really wouldn't even make a difference, sadly. Let's say we get, you know, the most progressive, you know, we find a, a, a black candidate. To get on to the Supreme Court, a black judge has been, you know, really progressive in his rulings. I, it wouldn't even matter; they're still outnumbered. So this is just show. This is just for their audience, like you said, to you know get them all riled up and excited. And they know how to twist it. You know, they use progress against us. Yeah, exactly. They use our yeah, own language against us. You are wrong to believe that whatever group you are a part of in a variety of different forms should ever be represented. And they say that from a point of view where they have been and will continue to be overrepresented for a very, very long time. So that's quite convenient. But I'm gonna play just a little bit more. This is so disgusting on so many levels, but I am going to inflict it on you. So take a look at this. People are gonna start to wonder about their quote representation. As long as we're divvying up the spoils like carrot cake, where's my slice? So Biden will nominate a black woman, great. She'll represent about 7% of the population. But where's Biden's Pacific Islander nominee? Maisie Hirono is probably writing an outraged letter about that right now, no doubt she is. And why isn't there an American Indian on the court or a gender queer or someone from the chronic fatigue syndrome community or a justice with cognitive disabilities? Why isn't there an Afghan refugee under consideration? You can laugh, but suddenly these are entirely fair questions. And by the way, Joe Biden, You claim that trans lives matter, really? Do you really mean that? Then prove it. What kind of woman is this anyway you plan to nominate? What are her pronouns? You can see where this is going. It always goes, our identity politics always ends with tribal warfare. It's funny the Biden people can't see that. Maybe they can see it and don't care, or maybe it's the entire point of the exercise. Whatever the explanation, the White House has no choice at this point to make good on Joe Biden's promise. 
Okay, so yes, maybe it's the entire point of the exercise. Maybe it's the entire point of the monologue actually. Uh, to denounce tribal warfare while trying to get your white audience to be horrified at the prospect of anyone other than them holding any position of power. That is the fundamental magic trick that he's capable of doing. He's not a particularly talented or impressive person in most areas, but he is able to do that. He's able to hoodwink his own audience. And so yes, there is a, it, you can laugh, he says, about the prospect of any of these sorts of groups having representation and his audience probably will. Uh, it's horrific to do so, but but they will. Um, and so unless you can simultaneously give every single group representation inside of any individual choice, there is no point in having even as a, an aspirational goal that our judiciary or any other aspect of our government, economy, society, all that should be representative. It's all a joke to him. Even though the goal for him is white male conservatives having these spots. They'll occasionally allow a white female conservative as long as she upholds patriarchy, white supremacy, all of that. And so again, it's denouncing all of these things while reinforcing for your audience the desire that we should have these things, but it should only be white people that have them. Where's my slice? Where? Yep. Uh, let's see, it's your symbi symbiotic twin, Kavanaugh, that's already on the court. There's your slice. Tucker, mm -hmm. he's exactly you there, a big crybaby that has nothing to say but complaints as if he had had the red carpet rolled out for him his entire life, letting him get away with DUIs and rape and God knows what else. Same thing for you, Tucker, we're gonna be finding a lot of skeletons in your closet, where's my slice of your carrot cake, it's disgusting. You wanna talk about representation, you wanna talk about trans lives, you don't care about any of that and how dare you, how dare you even utter it on the air, you're disgusting. Yep. On your little high horse, talking to these people, spewing hate. I can't, I get mad, John, I yeah. get mad, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, well, and that's why he said the, what kind of woman is this? Because you you cannot be in right wing media without trying to take every single issue and turn it into an opportunity to attack the trans community. Um, and again, not because, like, you think, this, this goes out, the rest of the audience, you're cool, don't even worry about this. But if you're a conservative, you're watching this. Are you dumb enough to think that Tucker Carlson goes home? He gets done, he's earned his million dollars a day or whatever. Then he goes home and he sits there and he's actually stewing about the trans community. It's not just a performance he puts on to distract Careless. you and, and fill you with anger and fear. No, he really passionately cares about this. You can't possibly be that stupid. Please, I don't want to think that you could be that dumb. But You're he dumb to enough to think there. they actually that he actually cares about them, John. <laughs> Let's yeah, not even true. consider the trans community. He doesn't care about his own viewers. He yeah. will sell them all down the river as his ancestors did. Yeah, that's true. Well, and also, like, I mean, you have to be kind of dumb to keep listening to a guy who has been desperately trying to kill you for two years now. <laughs> but anyway, and then the, the needless, like, well, then she's going to represent 7% of the country. Black women, screw you, you're not a large enough block for uh, for respect or for understanding or for, it's just, it, it is, it is, his show is everything that we've said that it is and it will continue to be. That is what it is, it's don't the same allow arguments anyone to fool you. We have heard from all of mainstream white men in power when we talked about affirmative action. Well, let's give people, well, I thought you believed in equality. Oh, this isn't equal, Oh, it's not fair. They don't understand equity, they don't understand how we need to make changes to make a difference. And or maybe they do understand it and they really don't want the change. So they're gonna be selling you this BS yeah. and people are just scooping it up and eating it like a bowl of cereal. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, or like a Swanson's frozen dinner. Anyway, um, <laughs> hungry uh, man. Yes, I did reorder that by the way, I just saw that. Uh, okay, let's move on to other reactions. Uh, Tucker Carlson wasn't the only one that freaked out over the prospect of a black woman finally being on the Supreme Court. Uh, let's see, let's, let's jump ahead just a little bit. You got Sean Hannity calling it gender discrimination to prioritize a woman. Just assuming that whoever we pick is going to be male, uh, presumably is not gender discrimination, okay. Uh, Newsmax host uh, Grant Stinchfield, who they swear is a real person, I don't think that he is. Um, <laughs> he speculates that Breyer retiring is part of a plot to install Hillary Clinton as president. Well, yesterday, after all, Fox was saying they're going to put Kamala Harris on the Supreme Court. That's deranged, so Newsmax has to be more deranged. So, 
after you put Harris on SCOTUS, this is what Grant Stinchfield thinks is gonna happen. What if he picked Hillary Clinton to be his vice president? Oh boy, then what if he picks Hillary Clinton and then decides to resign a short time later? Hillary gets the White House and then ultimately the chance to run as an incumbent. If you don't think that they're thinking about this, think again. This is not far fetched at all. This is one potential strategy that I promise you, who's thinking about Barack Obama, Susan Rice, George Soros, they're the ones considering this. After all, they're the ones who's pulling the strings, right? Throwing out Viviana, what you need to understand is that throwing out George Soros as the guy who is coming up with this insane thing isn't explicitly anti Semitic enough. He has to then explicitly invoke the puppet master trope by saying that George Soros, again, is the Jewish man who's pulling the strings on a, a, a politician. So. But it's, again, it's the dog whistle that has turned into a screaming siren. It is just yeah. horrendous. And when you, whenever you have somebody saying this is not far fetched at all, I mean, that's what you you got to worry. You got when they start telling you, don't think, don't use rationalization or critical thinking. No, yep, it's it's hundred percent, hundred percent. This well, is so they, this, this is look. mainstream now, John. This is real. Oh yeah, no, no, no. They, Tucker Carlson just came out with this like docu series about Hungary and George Soros. It's just you had 4chan and Infowars and Stormfront like 10 years ago, and uh, it was a little bit too early to go mainstream. But just you know, slap a blank stare on it, and it could be on Fox News literally every night. You know, so Aziz the- Ansari just did a, a special on Netflix, and he talks about content and how how good of content uh, Trump was. And it's really you got to check it out. It's actually a great special. It's pretty short. I'll take a look. And it's pretty poignant. This is what people yeah. are eating up. We want something to talk about. Exactly. Well, look, uh, there's the conspiracy theories, and then there's also uh, so Ben Shapiro. You think he's going to pass up an opportunity to imply no. that women of color <laughs> are qualified for their positions? So he says there's a reason Democrats never miss with their SCOTUS picks. They overtly choose wild leftists. Yep, that's why they wanted Merrick Garland because <laughs> he was a wild Antifa commie. Never anyway, miss. That's, that, that's I feel like we only, missed the last few times. Yeah, that's, that's also true. <laughs> That's the only real qualification. They wouldn't care whether Biden nominated an HLS grad who clerked for Breyer or Cardi B, so long as that person voted reliably left. Okay, and also said that he's violating federal civil rights law by wanting a black woman to be on the Supreme Court. Okay, so he's, I gotta run through a couple things because there he's talking about qualifications. The Dems don't care about it, presumably the right does. As Max Kennerly points out, Amy Coney Barrett's Senate questionnaire asked her to name her 10 most significant litigation matters. She could only name three cases. She was not lead counsel on any of them. Where are your qualifications concerns there? Which is totally true. Let's run through some of the recent Dem appointments to the SCOTUS. Every recent Democratic nominee for better or worse is a highly educated Ivy Leaguer. And I agree for better or for worse. I don't think that it's the most important thing. But Ben Shapiro, you better believe thinks that that's the most important thing. Kagan was Dean of Harvard Law. Sotomayor was top of her undergrad class at Princeton. Of course, Ben Shapiro has very recently gone on and on about how Sotomayor has to be stupid. Presumably it's not because she was head of her class at Princeton. Maybe there's some other reason he thinks that she has to be stupid. I'll let you fill in the blanks there. So who is the front runner right now to be Biden's pick? It is Katanji Brown Jackson, who presumably is just a wild lefty. She's not qualified in any way. She's being picked either because she's a wild lefty or because she's a black woman. Definitely not because she went to Harvard undergrad, graduated magna cum laude, then went to Harvard Law and was the editor of the Harvard Law Review. She was a judicial clerk, a public defender and a judge for literally decades. But it can't be any of that. Meanwhile, Amy Coney Barrett had never been a judge until 2017. She never tried a case to verdict or argued an appeal in court. And along the way, in addition to choosing Amy Coney Barrett and a guy who we only know because he really likes beer and he probably did some horrendous stuff to women over the course of his life. A number of nominees at various levels that Trump tried to get on to the judiciary. The American Bar Association ruled as fundamentally not qualified, nine of them. Seven of those were then confirmed by the Senate, the Republican Senate that cares so much about qualifications. Well, they might not have been qualified, but a lot of them were white and most of them were males. So maybe that had something to do with it. Well, the qualifications might be different than what you or I might prioritize. The most salient for Amy Barrett was that she was pro-life. So it really didn't matter what else she did in her career. The fact that they knew how she was gonna vote on this important Fact, yeah, was what got her in. 
hundred percent, yeah, yeah, they knew. And amidst all the other hypocrisy and the all the, all the other lies. We got one more little thing to go over though. It's sort of a tangent to a lot of this, but I just it's just needless additional insensitivity for the for the purpose of being insensitive. Uh, Gutfeld over there on the five is not gonna pass up an opportunity where the SCOTUS is once again in the news to mock the women who raise concerns about Brett Kavanaugh. Take a look at this. But I'll tell you this, whoever gets nominated, I'm going to say that that person, be they male or female or non-binary, did something really bad to me. <laughs> a long time ago. I'm not going to say what it is that they did to me. Can you remember high what school? they did? It, 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 it might have been, see, I don't know yet. It might be college. It might have been like high you know, school. Might have been in the gym. Who knows? But I'm going to tell you whatever I say is going to be 100% true and disgusting. And I would prefer if you guys just respected my privacy when this happens. So that's Gutfeld. He's a comedian, so he's making a joke. The point of the joke, of course, is that the women who have raised concerns about people like Brett Kavanaugh are obviously lying. And not only should you not trust them, even though he pretends that they didn't make incredibly specific accusations, pretending that I'm just not gonna tell you, don't ask. Um, and then by the way, the guy gets on the Supreme Court, and then we will spend the rest of our lives mocking those women who every time they get to see a SCOTUS decision, get reminded that the guy who harassed them, who abused them, who assaulted them is one of the most powerful individuals in the country. That is hilarious to people like Greg Gutfeld and the rest of that laughing pack of jackals on the five. You, you know what's sad about that panel? There's two women on that panel and the statistics today are one out of every five or six women are victims of rape. The chances that those women have been victims of a sexual assault or some sort of violence towards them from a man is very, very high and very likely. I'm sure that they're dealing with a lot of harassment in the career that they're in. And they just sat there and laughed. Yep. This is how, and, and they have to, John, because they want to keep that job. They can't argue with this. That's true, they got to play ball. It's yeah, and your point is obviously right, and it's even more right in that environment. It makes to me sad. do well at Fox, we know oh, yeah. that they were harassed and they were assaulted. And that, no, we're just gonna move on from that. It's all if, funny and if they women were all liars. Um, and if they weren't, because I'm not gonna make accusations about these women on the five, but if they weren't, they for a fact know someone who was. Yep, they know producers and they know hosts. There, there are female hosts who are, they were they had all the qualifications you need to have to be a host on a Fox. They were insane and they said crazy things, but they they raised the alarm about how they were being uh how they were being victimized. And this sort and so of just gaslighting that this gut is talking about, this is what keeps women silent and this is what makes it perpetual. This is what we, oh well, it's just a joke. <laughs> we just slapped a bunch of asses. It was just some frat boy games. This is what needs to stop. We have to stop this mentality. I mean, it's not, and it's getting worse. Now you're, oh, you're just a bleeding heart left. Why? Because I don't want women to be raped. Exactly. Yeah. Well, uh, unfortunately, this topic area is going to come up a couple more times in the show. It's it's a rough time in America, so uh, and around the world. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our first break. We come back. Lots more to get to. Don't go anywhere. Anyway, we're back. I'm here. <laughs> Viviana Vigil joins us. If you're just joining us, very excited to have you here, Viviana. Thank you for joining us once again. Yeah, I love being here. Thanks, okay. John. Well, we'll see if you still think that after the next couple of stories I'm going to make you talk about. So let's jump into this. A circuit judge in Florida tried to stop an anonymous 17 year old from getting an abortion because, and I swear this is true. He thought her GPA was too low to merit the respect necessary to let her choose to exercise her reproductive rights. Now, thankfully, that was appealed. And in a 2 1 ruling in the Florida Second District Court of Appeals, a panel of judges found that Doe, Jane Doe, was mature enough to earn what's known as a judicial bypass, an arduous legal process that lets minors get abortions without involving their parents. But to get to that appeal, you first had to be denied, again, based in part on GPA. So let's give you the details on that. In his original ruling, Hillsborough County Circuit Judge Jared Smith focused on the fact that Doe had originally said that she made B grades, but her current GPA is 2.0, quote, clearly a B average would not equate to a two GPA. Doe's quote, testimony evinces either a lack of intelligence or credibility. 
either of which weigh against a finding of maturity pursuant to the statute. Sorry, when I thought you were making Bs, you get to have rights. But if you're below a B, no, you're not mature enough, clearly. You didn't get the grades, and because you're so immature, we're gonna force you as a 17 year old to give birth to this child that you don't believe you're ready to take care of. So. The, again, Viviana, not the first time we've seen and, sort of and, this and sort no of mention, no mention of the brainiac who knocked her up. How about that? No mention of him. How and credible it's so is funny because we have, and I think it was Florida that was trying to uh, sterilize welfare recipients. So you're either not responsible enough, or you're too responsible, or you're. Come on, let's stop this nonsense, okay? This is a private matter between women and their doctor. And it is a horrible thing that anybody has to weigh and deal with, and they need to deal with it on their own. Mm -hmm. Because the fact that you have all these other people weighing in, first of all, how pregnant was she when she went first went to court? Now how pregnant is she? I thought you guys yeah, didn't like make sure report. Is she like nine months pregnant now? Like how long is this taking? Yeah, this is I ridiculous. Let her deal with her doctor. GPA, we all, I mean, I didn't have a good GPA in high school. I was bored half the time. It has no mention, it doesn't matter what your competency is. This is irrelevant. This is yeah. the dangers of no, but this, putting regulations on abortions. This is the danger. Look, I, I agree with you in principle, but this is how the Constitution works. I remember I had, it was my third semester in college. I did really badly. Literally, the only credit I got was for a jujitsu course I was taking. <laughs> and following that, I no longer had freedom of speech. I couldn't assemble <laughs> and I had to let soldiers quarter in my dorm room because you lose <laughs> your rights when your GPA drops. Sorry, I'm a guy, they would never do that to me. Anyway, it's even more offensive than it seems. Let's give you a, more, more details. Uh, a ruling written by Judge Daryl Casanueva and joined by later, uh, later joined by Judge Susan Rothstein Yukum uh, pointed out that if Doe is making Bs, then her current GPA may not reflect her newer grades. Again. Who cares? What does this matter? They're defending her. <laughs> in any case, quote, we observe a C average demonstrates average intelligence for a high school student. The evidence certainly did not show that her overall intelligence was less than average. When Smith used the fact, but so there's another way that he tried to take away her rights. When Smith used the fact that Doe doesn't care for any younger family members to evaluate her emotional stability, Casanueva pointed out that Doe doesn't have younger siblings. And while Smith said that Doe has never had any financial responsibilities, even so much as paying her own cell phone bills, Casanueva stressed that Doe works upward of 20 hours a week, has $1,600 in savings and two credit cards, and pays for practically everything but the cell phone bills. And, and she so, successfully carried an egg around for a week in health class. So yeah, she should be. <laughs> that's true. I, I think it's actually a pound of flour. Yeah. No, but again, all of this stuff is. You need to prove to us that you're financially secure and mature to have rights. If you're not financially secure, not mature, we don't think you're intelligent, then you will be forced to become a mom as a teen. That is, I, I know. But we that's don't only for women, John. For no mention exactly. of the man who impregnated her. No, they actually they gave him a ticket to London. He's going to be living abroad for a couple of years. Uh, he yeah, needs no, to it's nonsense. experience, you know, that sort of life. He wants to go study abroad. Yeah. Uh, 38 states, by the way, require that parents be notified uh, if a minor wants to get an abortion. It's and tricky that, that because the goal is to stop them. It, it's that. tricky because you know you want to protect your children and you want children and and a 16 year old, a 17 year old, a 15 year old, they all can get pregnant. You know, mm -hmm. and I can understand parents wanting to have a say and having to make sure that they're making good decisions, but this is one of those things, and we're and we're running into this with vaccines. Uh, kids having the right to take vaccines now. We're running into this when kids having access to birth control. So it, it's a real tricky thing, but when we need to start liberating women to have control over their sexual health early on. And education needs to precede all of this. And that's not what these people are working on. Like you really wanna cut down on abortions, then invest in preventing pregnancy mm -hmm. by educating, by providing Obviously, prophylactics. Yeah. I mean, this is the easy solution. But that's not gonna, I don't know, get people to vote. I don't know what the issue is here. And these judges are really disgusting. I, 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 I get what you said, and obviously it's not up to me and shouldn't be up to me. Um, I, I don't trust too many parents to make the, the lives of these young women a living hell to try to stop them. Having no consideration whatsoever for what the women want, what life as, they as want. As a to former lead. social I don't trust worker, the 
I, I, as a former social worker here in LA County, I know a lot of parents often have great intentions, but that doesn't mean that it's the best decision. And if these kids are savvy enough to be engaging in sexual behavior, and you weren't uh, overbearing parents enough to prevent that, then maybe they need mm-hmm. to continue making their own choices so that they can move forward in their lives. I mean, sure. it's a tough call, but we need to start empowering young women to be making choices about prophylactics, about birth control, about their sexual health. And that includes taking vaccines that prevent uh, HPV, all these kinds of things. It's a, it's a whole controversy. And I understand parents wanting to be involved, but at some point we have to decide yeah. When these kids can make these decisions, I agree. And by the way, many Republicans will immediately look at her and say, "Oh, she's she's sleeping around and she doesn't want to be responsible." She says she's not financially stable yet, and she wants to be able to be on her own first. She wants yeah, to ultimately let, let her, well, wait, hold on. She wants to join the military, then go to college and become a nurse. No, but she's yeah. irresponsible. So let's say she has the baby for their choice, their choice, not hers, and then she ends up on welfare. Then she's irresponsible. Then she's and she or she is trying to make her responsible. So it's a double edged sword, and and a lot of young women. I mean, I I really we got to fight for them, John. Yeah, we got to fight for women's health rights. Supreme Court matters. Those those rights all might all be gone. By the way, in like it's getting close. It's getting close. Yes. Okay, well with that, we gotta we gotta breeze through this next story. I just want to make sure that people have this update because the hour is rapidly running through. So let's jump into this next one. Yet another update following several more earlier this month on the legal case against Matt Gates. So I wanna remind you of a little bit of the history and the new ripple that's been added to it. Back on September 4th, 2017, according to his confession letter, Joel Greenberg called his friend, Representative Matt Gates, with some bad news. A teenager both men had paid to have sex with was underage, Greenberg claimed. Now, two sources tell the Daily Beast a cooperating witness can confirm details of that call for one damning reason. He was in Greenberg's office when the call took place. So we already knew about the confession from Joel Greenberg. We know about the allegations. Now there's apparently someone who is there to say they were there for the call. The witness is a Big Joe Ellicott. So again, you're getting a real sense for the social circle of the congressman. Greenberg's longtime best friend and an employee at the Seminole County Tax Office recently pleaded guilty to fraud and drug charges as part of a cooperation agreement with federal prosecutors. Two people briefed on the matter can confirm Ellicott was present for the call. The call they said was short and Gates was the one who ended it. And we can sort of understand why that would be. Now, Ellicott's corroboration, if true, would contradict Gates' repeated assertions that he never had sex with an underage girl as an adult. He told the Daily Beast last March, quote, the last time I had a sexual relationship with a 17 year old, I was 17. Instead, if this is true, it would suggest that Gates has been aware of this fact for nearly the entirety of his time in the House of Representatives. It's the sort of thing that would really weigh on a a normal person. I have a feeling Gates has probably been okay with it. Again, these are just allegations, Viviana, but apparently there is a witness that was there for that phone call. It is really baby Gates, here he goes again. I mean, I I have suspicions that he knew of this the whole time. I mean, clearly he was paying for sex from young women. He wasn't very concerned with whether or not they were underage. It's really, really sad. And here's an example about how the right there's this arbitrary line of what's old enough, right? Here's a 17 year old in Florida trying to access healthcare. She's not mature enough, but yet she could be yeah. in bed with baby Gates over here and that's okay. She made a decision, she knew what she was doing. So it, it's really yeah. horrible. We knew the guy was lying, I knew. I mean, my gut was telling me he was lying. Now we have some more hardcore proof, we weren't for sure. Now we know he probably did know. I assume he knew the whole time and he was actually looking for yeah. either underage or very close to being barely legal type of. Uh, yeah, well, and let's bear in mind, this is not the only woman that is alleged to have been wrapped up in this. This is just the one where there's the clearest train of evidence. That said, I still don't know how much expectation I have of anything. It all looks bad and it keeps looking worse, but. I mean, look, Gates's ex-girlfriend testified earlier this month as part of an immunity deal. We got this new guy, we got Joel Greenberg. But they seized Gates's phone in December 2020. It's been 14 months, what has it been since then? Yeah. What, is, what is taking us so long? And so that's why 
as it grinds on, I start to fear more and more that no, he's a congressman. He's gonna find oh, some way got, to get out of it. He's a congressman from a, a very powerful family. So he mm-hmm. has a lot of people that can pull strings for him. All, you know, this is not against people who are, are doing sex work, but when you are actively seeking out very young sex workers, that's concerning. Yeah. That's concerning. Are these women gonna wanna testify? Do, no. do you have any idea how many death threats they will immediately get if they come forward? And for years and years and years from the right, because I mean, this guy is a mafia Gutt, guy. Mr. Gut on the five, look at what he'll tear him apart. I mean, you yeah, can't- for years he will. You, you can't say anything and, you, and they'll call her a whore and they'll do all the, you know what you were doing. There's no yeah. benefit for coming forward and fighting this fight against powerful white men like this. Exactly, yeah, it's it's all sacrifice. Okay, um, really fast, I just wanna jump to the last graphic here. Uh, this is how producer Sophie uh, found out that there was new Gates news. It was this tweet from Matthew Gertz who says, oh no. Yeah. <laughs> Because he has been, he has gotten a lot of tweets intended for Matt, Matt Gates <laughs> along the way. <laughs> Poor Matt Gertz. He did not do these things, just Poor to guy. be clear. He's like, here it comes. <laughs> oh no, dear God. God, God, no, as Nina Turner would say. Anyway, with that said, we're going to take our second break. When we come back, uh, more censorship coming from the right and from it, it, it's going to make your blood boil even more if it's not already. We'll be back after this. Okay, Oh, I just, there, there's a graphic in here. Thank you to whoever put this in the notes. I just realized what the, I saw that going around Twitter, but I didn't realize what it was. Anyway, lots more news to get to. We're gonna try to fit in both these topics and what remains. Let's jump into this. You've been warned for years now that the left is too censorious. They're doing a cancel culture all over you. And yet more and more books seem to be banning being banned and it doesn't really look like the left is behind much of it. You can now add to that list Mouse, a very very well respected and well known graphic novel that has now been banned by a Tennessee school board. They banned the Pulitzer Prize winning novel from his classrooms over eight curse words and an illustration of a naked cartoon mouse. The graphic novel Mouse, a survivor's tale is by New Yorker Art Spiegelman uses hand-drawn illustrations of mice and cats to depict how they all the all parents at Auschwitz during the Holocaust. And uh, this story, like there is absolutely no way, I'm just gonna say as a side note, that John Oliver is not gonna cover this. The fact that it is <laughs> fundamentally about a mouse being naked in cartoon form, it's not a human. But anyway, they've banned it. You can see a picture here. You probably come across this, perhaps in libraries, perhaps in in, in bookstores. It's quite popular, quite well known. Won a ton of literary awards back in the 90s, but 10 board members unanimously agreed to remove it. They cited the use of the phrase goddamn and drawings of naked pictures of women, mice. Um, They said there is some rough objectionable language in this book. We don't need to enable or somewhat promote this stuff. I am not denying it was horrible, brutal and cruel. Like the Holocaust, yeah, pretty bad. Maybe worth knowing about, but Viviana, nope. Yeah. They said, "God damn!" So, nope. You don't get this well, allegory for concentration camps. Newsflash to the school board in Tennessee: um, all mice are naked all the time. <laughs> that is true. They're just running true. amok in our cities, flaunting their non. Nipples. I don't know. Do mice have nipples? <laughs> They're mammals, right? Is that they can we say have. nipples? Yeah. Are we gonna get know. banned? I'll okay. never know because I can't see the image now. <clears throat> Books like this, John, not only educate our youth about the horrors of the Holocaust, but they also awaken an empathy towards suffering and and, and, and invoke a thirst for justice and for peace. And it, it starts to really kind of be like, wow, this happened. And and to write it in a way that kids can understand it is very difficult already. Here we have some two pieces, it's mouse one and mouse two, both, both uh, I guess the sequel, what's the, I can't think of the name of the next book, the next volume. I, I don't know the name, I apologize. It's, it's mouse one and mouse two, they're both called mouse. Mm-hmm. Anyway, both have been banned. This, this is this whole attack on critical race theory, it, It's this is where it comes down to it. We don't want yeah. it, we shouldn't talk about the horrible stuff, should we? No, exactly, we just, shouldn't learn. Kids don't, we don't wanna learn about, the, it happened and yeah. we do need to talk about it. And it wasn't just 
the Jewish people that suffered the Holocaust. We have Native Americans that suffered Holocaust. We have Mesoamerica. We have all kinds of examples of this. And when we start learning about it, that's how we start changing the future. So this is just, I mean, I'm speaking to the choir here, but this is pretty horrific. And you know, Tennessee's a bit backwards in, in, in their thoughts on this, I have to say. You guys are gonna have to step it up and really start thinking about what yeah. you're well, Go ahead, look, John. Uh, uh, unfortunately, it's it's t- Tennessee is doing this, but lots of other places are banning yeah. all sorts of books for simply you know having committed the crime of being written by a member of the LGBTQ community or having a black author or whatever. Any like the standard is now if you can find a single parent that has a problem with it, you can pluck it out. You go, you take the books, I don't know, you throw them away, you burn them, and then you start talking about how cancel culture is terrible. That is how yeah. they are spending their time and now. Can teach lessons, and they don't want that. They especially don't want lessons about the Holocaust. And presumably, Animal Farm has pig on horse violence, so that's out. Can't have that. 1984, he drinks gin. That's a bad example for kids. Don't learn anything, kids. Look, fundamentally, and this again goes out to the conservatives. They want your kids dumb and weak. That's what they want, and they will say that it's strength. It's not. They'll say I'm protecting them from having their feelings hurt. They want them dumb and weak. They don't want them capable of posing a threat to the system. That's what it is. Really fast, I apologize, we're gonna go slightly over. Here, here is why something like this might be necessary. According to a poll from two years ago, almost two thirds of young American adults do not know that six million Jews were killed during the Holocaust. One in 10 believe that Jews caused the Holocaust. Wow. 48% could not name a single concentration camp or ghetto established during World War II. Almost a quarter said they believed the Holocaust was a myth or had been exaggerated or they weren't sure. One in eight said they had definitely not even heard about the Holocaust. Wow. More than half though have seen Nazi symbols on their social media platforms because that is still freely available. That's everywhere, um, but kids don't know about this stuff and the Republicans Love the growing ignorance. They don't want people knowing about this. They don't want them to learn lessons from history because the Republicans want to repeat these things. Well, to quote 1984, the past was erased, the erasure was forgotten, and the lie became the truth. Yeah, that's from the book. They're erasing it one book at a time. But again, the left is censorious. Oh, and by the way, the Free Speech Brigade is going to lose it over this, just like they did over that history professor, I believe in Florida, his uh, his presentation being canceled again. They hate censorship, so they're going to be all over this. Yeah. Yeah, wait for that. Nope. Okay, <laughs> uh, we got one more story to fit in with what remains in this first hour. It's a pretty interesting one, so let's jump into this. A city in California has instituted, put into effect what seems to be the first law requiring liability insurance for gun owners. This is San Jose, they voted Tuesday night to require that for people who own guns. It's the first of its kind in a city in America. Under the proposed ordinance, all San Jose residents who own a firearm must maintain a homeowner's, renter's, or gun liability insurance policy that specifically covers losses or damages resulting from any negligent or accidental use of the firearm. Including if the gun is stolen or lost, the owner would be considered liable until the theft or loss is reported to authorities. However, gun owners who don't have insurance won't lose their guns or face any criminal charges. It's apparently sort of a fine situation. So it could be stronger, but this means that you will be responsible for the deadly weapon you're choosing to have around. And what I love is that before, if your gun was stolen or lost, Presumably you weren't considered liable, you didn't have to report it. (laughs) Guess I gotta get another gun, somebody's out there with a weapon they really want it right now. But nah, whatever, you don't need to talk about it. You know, I got it. I got. It's great to see some some more accountability with gun ownership. Um, I'm a little bit dubious about where the money is gonna go. Anytime it involves insurance, it's like, is this really gonna do anything? Because it's gonna go to a nonprofit. They haven't decided what nonprofit, so somebody's gonna establish it. How are they gonna implement? They're supposed to, you know, provide suicide awareness. Uh, I, so I'd like to know more information before I'm in like all favor for it. I'd like to make it a little bit harder for people to get guns, not just mm-hmm. have insurance if you have one. Let's make it a little bit more uh, of a process and a screening process to get guns. I'm not against it, people having guns, but let's just not pass them out like Tic Tacs. Yeah. Yeah, 
Well, um, we have a little bit of information about the goals for some of the money. So uh, in addition to what we've already talked about, San Jose gun owners will be asked to pay an annual fee of between $25 to $35 to a nonprofit organization that will be created to manage the funds and use them to provide a broad range of services to residents who own a firearm or live in a household with someone that does, including suicide prevention programs, domestic violence services, mental health and addiction services, and firearm safety training, according to the city's ordinance. And uh, by the way, there is a carve out if you are, uh, let's see, a sworn active reserve or retired police officer, people who have a license to carry a concealed weapon. So it's entirely possible this will just result in more people getting that. And low income residents who are exempt from paying court fees because of their financial state. So there is an understanding about the financial burden in theory. And people who presumably for their job, police officers are likely to have guns will not have to pay that. But this could result in a little bit of help to people who will end up being victims of gun violence, even those who didn't purchase it don't own a gun. If you live near a gun, you are statistically more likely to be a victim of violence coming from it. I'd like to see some caveats saying if it's not locked up properly, mm -hmm. then there's some sort of like responsibility, you know, stuff yeah. like that. But it gets tricky, John. You know, we it's this whole freedom deal. We got to protect it, and we got to make so it, it, it's I, it's a new. Okay, we're working towards stuff. California is a bit more advanced than other states in regards to responsibility towards gun ownership. It's a little bit more difficult to get a gun in this state than in other states, but we're far away from really protecting people from mass shootings and getting guns in mm -hmm. the hands of like 13 year old angsty white boys. Mm -hmm. And look at the position that people who see the massive amount of gun violence and think that that's a bad thing. I would wish that that was everybody in America, but clearly it isn't. The position they've been put in in terms of reform. So no matter what you propose, no matter how mild, no matter how experimental or whatever, it is presented as being the equivalent of instituting a nationwide seizure of every gun, which basically nobody has ever proposed. You can't ask for people to have insurance. You can have insurance for things like a car. I mean, that's deadly, but a gun, no, that's necessary. You can't, for instance, look at how they've responded um, to uh, the, the sale of smart guns, guns that will only trigger for people who have like their fingerprint registered. Gun owners, or the NRA at least, regular gun owners probably don't mind. Uh, and right wing pundits absolutely despise that. They lose their minds over it. So. Like they say you're coming for our guns, but when gun uh, uh, law reform advocates are just trying to make it a little bit more responsible, making sure that people have help, you can still have the gun, but let's try to make it a little bit harder for your kid to grab it, put it in his backpack and go do a mass shooting at a school. They lose their minds over that too. They are absolute out of control radicals on this topic. That and they're kid doing it. that just shot up a school, his mom knew he had the gun. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is not stopping what we really need to stop. There's a lot, and that's why I'd like to see what this money is being spent on. And I get a little bit dubious when I hear insurance because has car insurance really prevented more accidents or I don't know, I guess victims of, of you know hit and runs and what can get. So let's see what's done with this money because we have a really big problem in this country. And I don't know that having insurance alone is gonna be really the solution. Yeah, no, I agree. I'm interested. I think that you know, democracy is supposed to be you know a lot of experiments and everything. I'd like to see how it goes. But but also remember, in a lot of places, it's difficult to get anything done. You have to be clever to come up with something that won't immediately be stopped by a huge influx of money from gun interests. So yeah, we'll see. Maybe they're they're trying to do something. We'll see how it goes. Okay, that said. Uh, oh, geez, we only have 30 seconds. I was going to read some comments. Uh, let's see. Uh, Goose Jail says, Are you going to cover the story about the anti work Reddit mob that went on Fox and single handedly destroyed the movement under three minutes? I, I've seen the video. Um, I believe it is being covered on the network. We couldn't fit it into the rundown today. Um, it's an unfortunate circumstance, I'll just say that. In any event, we will be reading more of your comments after this. If you're on YouTube, Twitch, or the members app, more news coming. Viviana and I will take a short little break, but we'll be right back, so don't go anywhere.
Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.